budget limited. I think that we need to look at it in the broader perspective of what the responsibilities of the legislature are. And if you want to look at it at just looking at financial responsibility and the fact that we are having some powers to ensure that we exercise that responsibility of oversight on the financial or the finances of the country, you may take the position that many people have taken that parliament is not living up to its expectation. But when you go beyond just the financial responsibility and look at our role as an arm of government that is clued with authority to legislate, to make laws, and also look at what we do to serve as, if you like, a link between the executive and our constituents, then you may not come to the conclusion that many people have come to. And in a democracy, it is understandable. Mm -hmm. We have practiced different kinds of democracies before. We have done the, uh, the legislative system. We have done the executive system. And it is not for nothing that 1992, we decided to come with the hybrid nature of our democratic government. Because mm -hmm. we weighed, if you like, the negatives of the two systems of governance that we had. And therefore, felt that the only way we can overcome those challenges is to look at having the hybridity of our government. But you see, the reason why people are justified to come to such conclusions also is because of the nature of the parliament we have today. We have a hung parliament. Mm -hmm. So the expectations of people are that with a hung parliament, the executive should not just have their way. And I think that if you look at what we have done as people from the opposition, we demonstrated that level of independence and that oversight. One, for the first time in our democracy, at least in the Fourth Republic, that we rejected a budget we felt was not in sync with the interests of the people of this country. For the first time in our democracy, as under the Fourth Republic, that we're able to reject a policy of government, a very huge policy, the e-levy of government. And we all witnessed what happened. We witnessed what happened. And it was not just within the ambit of parliament, but also the, the judiciary came in and took a decision a decision that was not a decision that we took as a legislative arm. So right. it would be fair for people to look at those responsibilities. And I believe if we do that and weigh in the two, or if like those responsibilities and you can come to the conclusion you come to, I may not have a problem with it. But as to what we are supposed to do, as to the limited time that we need to exhaust this. Mind you, after the presentation of the budget, we have what we call the post-budget workshop where you know government including par parliament would have to tell us the justification you know for arriving at some of the policy decisions it gives us an insight so that that can properly inform the debate we're going to have in parliament and i think that until such is done i may not be able to tell you clearly what i think my position is with regards to the budget what we expected and you remember last year budget mm -hmm. i raised this issue i said over the years we would have been given copies of the budget statement at least four days before the presentation of the budget. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be the case under this government. As we sit today, we still do not have copies of the budget. Mm -hmm. and we don't it, have it. No, we do not have. I mean, you have been reporting in Parliament. Yes. Under the NBC, under the NBC, and I'm not saying this because I'm an NBC member, we'll be given copies of the budget statement sometimes a week before the presentation is done. Now, if you tell me that, oh, you can go to the internet, go to the website of the Minister of Finance to read it, how many people would have the luxury to go and read it on the website? It would have been appropriate you give us the copy. And this has been one of the defects of our legislative arm. They bring financial agreement to parliament, and within 30 minutes, they expect you to read and pass. Some of us have been protesting anytime things like that are brought up. We are representing people. We are representing the interests of the people. So when you have a major policy decision, such as a budget, it would be appropriate that you give us even copies of it two weeks. Because there are certain decisions we will take in this budget which would demand that we consult our constituents. Now, I come here, then you, you are not giving me a copy. You present it, and the next day you tell us that we should go for post-budget workshop. We go there two days, then we come back the next day, we are starting the debate. Members of parliament would not even have the time to go to their constituents, which is supposed to be the case. Because if there's a major policy decision on agriculture, mm -hmm. a major policy decision on education, on health, it will be appropriate that I inform my people, this is what government wants to do. What is your position? But you see, because we are not doing that, we all tend to be taking the positions that our political parties have taken, mm. sheepishly. 
But because if I don't the... have the opportunity to consult my constituent, how do I even inform my party to understand that, look, this is the position of the people of Tamale Central? Now, if we had ample time and all members of parliament consult our constituents, then we can arrive at a, a, a position which would inform the position our party should take. But because we don't have that time, the parties take position, and you would have to agree with the position of the party vis-a-vis -vis the NPP. I think that this is one of the defects of our legislative army going forward. You're, you're a member of the Trade and Industry Committee of Parliament. Yes. In fact, the business community has been consistent about how taxes are, are also impacting on the cost of doing business, and as a result, a number of them having to even close down. Briefly, what are the expectations you have of the 2024 budget to address those specific concerns? There isn't the any hope anywhere. More taxes. The IMF agreement we have entered into. If they demand physical discipline, why would they demand physical discipline? It means that there is physical indiscipline. If they demand that we need to increase our revenue mobilization, how do you increase revenue mobilization? Except that you are going to, you know, burden the people of this country with more taxes. So clearly, I don't think that there's any way. If the targets set by government to be able to meet the demands expected of them by the IMF, to be able to overcome these challenges, then they are going to impose more taxes on the already suffering Ghanaian. And clearly, that is what is going to happen. Or clearly. Tax to GDP has to be increased from 13 to 18%. Why did we even get to that stage? We shouldn't have. And the reason why we are where we are is because of how disastrously the economy was managed. Look, I'll tell you one thing. I can sit here and MPP can sit here and we do our NDC MPP politicking. But the ordinary man on the street care less about the jargons that we quote. The ordinary man wants to see that how much am I now paying for transportation from my home to the ministry or other agencies looking for jobs that are not available. The ordinary man cares now how much was I spending on electricity, on water? How much am I spending now? The ordinary Ghanaian is interested in his living condition. And that is why I have said repeatedly, every economic policy that doesn't get towards improving the living conditions of the people of that country is useless. It seems to me that this government is interested in, in changing our figures. And in fact, those figures are not even encouraging. But even if the figures were encouraging, if we're reducing inflation, if debt to GDP was reducing, if our debt portfolio, both domestic and external debt, were reducing, if there were some improvement in the conditions of the people of this country, nobody would have given a jot. But the figures are not even encouraging. The living conditions are worsening. And if you observe today, the whole idea of our democratic engagement is reduced to religion. And that is what the MPP strategy is. Let's talk about the fact that Dr. Baumia is a Muslim. And therefore, the people of this country are Muslim should vote for him because he's a Muslim. And that okay. is what they are doing in Muslim communities. They right. cannot hide. Look, let me tell you, I'm a practicing Muslim, but I don't care who rules this country. The person who rules this country, who sees every Ghanaian as Ghanaian, is what is of tremendous concern to me. If you go to buy wache, the wache seller, seller will not accept your religion. True. Unfortunately, right. the whole idea, the debate is reduced to religion. Look. And if you observe, strategically, mm -hmm. they reduce the suffering of the people of this country to breaking the eight. Okay. We are breaking the eight. And now they have decided to reduce it to religion. Why is it that religion has become a major determinant as to who we elect as a president of Ghana? Why is it so? Haven't we had elections? And this is not the first time that we have a, a Muslim in the ticket. Ali Mama was a Muslim. Religion was not an issue. But that is the agenda Dr. Baume and the MPP are advancing. And I can tell you this. They have started doing something in the Muslim communities. And some of us will fight it. Look, okay. I'll, I'll give an example. And what they do, up no, no, what, what they do is that they do it behind the scene, trying to get to people's homes, engage youth groups at their sitting places, telling them that you need to vote Baume because he's a Muslim. Absolutely rubbish. Okay. Senegal, right. Senegal. Senegal right. is almost 90% Muslims. Senegal had a Christian who ruled that country for 18 years. Right. And these were the golden ages of Senegal. So we have a simple message to them. Right. They should desist from that this country is peaceful because of religious tolerance. And okay. the fact that these things are now happening, and we don't have the courage and the guts to confront them, yet when someone confronts them, oh, it becomes an issue. What Sam George said, 
What okay, was wrong with well, that? Well, so so you you've adequately responded to that, and uh, you responded to the issues about how this was going to impact on the on on the uh, trading community. But then you dovetail into this. But I thank you very much uh, for for this because this is a conversation that is going to continue for as long as this race is on course going into 2024. So really, really do uh, appreciate you on that. But you expect that some taxes should be removed, especially for the uh, the, the private sector as well. They've been crying for you, this. You say I can I, I didn't hear what you just said. The, the, the taxes yeah. on the private sector. Yeah. That's what I ask you as a member of the Trade and Industry Committee of Parliament. Yeah. But I also have Gideon Ayi Ogu, who is a partner with tax, tax and regulatory at Deloitte Ghana. Gideon, it's good to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. So is, is this a, a realistic expectation of the business community to see taxes reduced or removed at a time when government needs all the money that it can get? Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, at, at this time, from our interactions with the, the business community, almost everybody is asking for reduction of taxes. Uh, because of the inflationary rates you are facing now, and the, the fact of the depreciation of the CD, which is spoiling this uh, rising, they, they think that once the taxes are reduced, um, it will give them a bit of a respite or relief to be able to maintain the market that they are growing. Because they keep on talking about competitiveness. And currently, for a lot of them, they feel that producing in Ghana here with a high cost of goods and inputs, and coupled with all the other issues, it's easier for somebody to then import and then come and sell. So on this basis, they are looking at the reduction of taxes. But then realistically to our side, they also understand that government needs the revenue to be able to carry on the development growth and agenda. However, the thing is, it looks like a certain class of people have been taxed most of the time. And then we all keep on saying expanding the tax base. So whilst they are looking at the fact that taxes should not be increased, if it happens to be increased, they should look at the other untaxed areas or areas that previously have been under the radar, rather than just identifying or going after the main persons or main businesses uh, operating. Uh, so so th this is how the view is coming out. Great. Uh, you're still live here on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7. We're going to be showing you what's happening in the chamber right now. And um, it's, it's, it's uh, clearly filling up. In fact, the speaker has taking his seat and is uh, to preside over the business of the house today. Right Honorable Vox Urban Suma Nakins for Bagwin um, is proceeding. Yes, just a quick one. Yes. Mm -hmm. When taxes are reduced, right. yet your city depreciates, the currency that you use to buy in those right. imports that are brought. What benefit will it be to you as a business? Okay, great, in, in, well, quickly. That, that's a very good question. Uh, and, and I want to bring an example, uh, which we are all facing now. And uh, I'm saying this from a purely objective point of view. Mm -hmm. We see the issue of the uh, uh, sanitary parts. And uh, when, you, when you look at the price increments over the years, mm -hmm. a lot of it is not just on tax. Taxes are there, but a lot of it is coming from the depreciation of the city. Mm -hmm. So if you reduce the taxes and the city continues to depreciate, it erodes that benefit or that, that you recently have uh, uh, gained as a result of the tax relief. But has that decision re achieved its objective, the decision to remove, uh, in fact, impose the taxes on sanitary parts? Um, well, if, if the, what I can tell you for a fact is that if you look at the price increments over the past four years, a major component of the increments in those things is coming from the fact that the city has depreciated because we end up importing a lot more of it. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it, let's say from 2018 up to now, and you see what right. component of the increment is coming from inflation and what component of it is coming from taxes, you see that the city's depreciation is accounting for a significant portion of that. Fantastic. Thank you. And uh, please, we, we, we're going to come back to you for a bit more on this particular one because um, it's important to understand uh, the objective of imposition of taxes, for instance, and uh, uh, also what issues related to the efficiency of the spending of tax revenue. And that's where the issue is and the concerns are as we speak. And uh, you're also live here on TV3, also live on 3FM 
92.7 and TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. And remember this. Presentation of, in fact, making them in taxes, uh, especially, and then also matters arising relating to what has to be done in ensuring that the economy grows as well. Honourable John Jinapo is the member of parliament for the Diamond. Honourable Samuel Abu Jinapo is a member of parliament for the Diamond Gold constituency. He is the minister in charge of lands and natural resources and then also a member of a number of committees in this eighth parliament. He's joining us for a very important conversation ahead of this 2024 budget presentation. Honorable Samuel Abujanapo, thank you very much for joining us here on TV3. Thank you very much for having me and a very good morning to your cherished viewers. Great. It's good to now, be here. It, it, it's all, uh, indeed good to have you. Now, there, there, there's a specific concern um, about the, your sector. That is, let's start off there with, with the lands and natural resources sector. Is whether or not there's enough measures have been put in place to address the issue of illegal mining. What is the state of affairs now? Because we still see the waters being polluted and then also farmlands, in fact, forest cover still being destroyed despite that pronounced commitment to fight illegal mining. What's the ministry's own assessment? Well, so thank you very much. Um, first of all, I think it's important for us to recognize that globally, wherever you have an extractive industry, whether it's a mining industry or petrochemical industry, you are having to grapple with issues of illegalities because at the heart of these extractive industries is money. And, and therefore, people tend to be recalcitrant, people tend to be stubborn, and people tend to devise all kinds of methods to outwit and, and overreach um, the authorities of the country. But that said, I, I am happy to report that yes, we have not um, as yet resolved all the issues relating to illegal mining in our country. Like you rightly pointed out, and many pundits have pointed out, we still have issues of illegal mining, and we still have a lot of uh, issues to deal with when it comes to the mining sector generally, but the small-scale mining sector in particular. But that said, we have put in place considerable measures, and we are making some progress, albeit um, incrementally, and, 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 and also recognizing that we still have some challenges. But the fact remains that the culture of impunity, which had gripped the mining sector over the years, from 2016 when the governance architecture broke down, and when um, illegal mining was so much on the ascendancy to the point where Anglo Gold Ashanti had to be closed down because of invasion by illegal miners. All the way to this time, through the two prong approach of reformation, reformation being generally reforming the uh, legal policy and operational framework for the small scale mining sector, and the enforcement mechanism, the use of operation hall, the military, the decommissioning and demobilization of equipment used for illegal small-scale mining, for example, excavators and the rest. Through this two-pronged approach, I will say that we are not out of the woods here. There's considerable work yet to be done, particularly when it comes to prosecution and when it comes to convicting these illegal miners to serve as a deterrent. We, we are, um, are very much on top of the situation. And uh, on a daily basis, we, we launch operations upon operations. And I mean, last week, for example, there was a clash between Forest Commission guards and illegal miners in a particular forest reserve. And unfortunately, we lost two lives. This matter is still being investigated. Mm -hmm. But the point I seek to make is that we have not relented, not even for a second, on our fight against illegal small scale mining. It's work in progress. And if you check anywhere in the world, whether it's in Australia or Canada or South Africa or wherever, where you have a mining industry. They continue to grapple with the issues of illegalities. Mm -hmm. And what is important is our steadfastness, is our commitment, and above all, I should say, our integrity and transparency. And we are doing just that. And it is the integrity and transparency that I'm going to stay with, because there are many who have asked questions about 
whether government really um, is sincerely committed to fighting illegal mining, especially because of some of the decisions that have been taken. For instance, the laws that have been passed over the period, the uh, CSOs have raised concerns about the... Law that the, have been passed on what? Or specifically to ensure that even forest reserves can't be mined. The CSOs have raised concerns about LI-2462, which was approved by the House. Now, and that gives mining companies access to even forest reserves. So what was the intent in passing LI-12462 when you have committed to preserving forest reserves in this country? The, uh, the LI you referred to was sponsored by the Ministry of Environment, Science and Technology. And um, the jury is out there to determine the uh, appropriateness or otherwise of this particular ally. And I will not make too much comment on that. But it is not correct that there is an ally which permits indiscriminate mining in forests. Is there. That is not correct. At least we, no, it's not. We, it's not we, correct. We, 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 Hold on. A number of things happening as a, as well, a result it's not, of It's that. not correct that there is an ally which permits indiscriminate mining in forests. Is there. That is At least previously there was an ally that permitted just about 2% of forest reserves to be mined. But now that has been set aside and this ally is in place. I'm saying it's not correct because an ally is subsidiary legislation and therefore is subservient to an act of parliament. Mm -hmm. And the act of parliament which regulates mining, i.e. Act 703, which is the Minerals and Mining Act 206, Act 703, and the enabling law for the Forestry Commission, the enabling law for the Environmental Protection Agency, will not and cannot allow indiscriminate mining in forest reserves and will uh, take precedence over an ally. But uh, having said that, I mean, it's also important for us to face some of the realities of our uh, legal regime when it comes to mining. It is not, mining in forest reserve is not prescribed by law. I mean, I'm not saying it, that's what the law says. Mm -hmm. you, uh, mining is permitted in forest reserve, but under strict conditions and strict environmental protocols. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Newmont Ghana, mm -hmm. which is the biggest mining company in the world, and is the biggest mining company in Ghana, mines in the forest reserve. And Newmont got their concession about 20, 30 years ago. What it is is that small scale mining is not permitted in forest reserves. That has been our biggest problem. Permitting small scale mining in forest reserves. Small scale mining is not permitted in forest reserves. Secondly, even when large scale mining operations are permitted in forest, they are supposed to be done within a certain strict environmental protocol. And many a times we have difficulty and challenges with that. Now, the Forest Commission has been very strict on mining activities, whether large scale or small scale mining activities in forest. And as I just given an example, just about a week ago, I'm dealing with a situation where forest gas had to go and flush out illegal miners in a particular forest reserve, and it resulted in the killing of two Ghanaians, two illegal small-scale miners. Now, what we have tried to do is to cordon off the 274 or so odd forest reserves of our country. Mm -hmm. And by and large, I am happy to say that that effort is yielding some results. First of all, we've put a, a strict regime on the grant of entry permits in our forest reserve, entry permits of any sort into our forest reserve. Whereas in the past, there was an, an indiscriminate grant of forest entry permit, now it's become the exception rather than the norm. But it's also important, my friend, mm -hmm. for us to point out that it's not all the information that is put out there which is correct, which is sacrosanct. Let okay. me give you an example. There's been this brouhaha about Kakum yes, Forest Reserve. Yes, I was coming to that. Well, how, how did the High Street Limited even have the thought to apply for a mining or prospecting license in the Kakum National Park. How? What <laughs> happened? You know, I've had to, I have had to laugh a bit because a question like this, what is the answer I'm supposed to give? Are you, how, how do you determine who makes an application? No, how, no hold the on, reason hold on. This is a national park and you're saying oh, that the, the, hold you, on, you, hold you, on. your forestry commission has been very strict no, no. in ensuring mm -hmm. that forest reserves are preserved. This ah, is a national asset. No, hold on. Kakum National Park. No, it doesn't, it doesn't take away the point I'm making. The point I'm making is that how do I determine that Mr. Jinapo don't go and apply for a forest, uh, 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 a mining lease in Kakum National Park or Moli National Park 
or how do I determine that Kofi Mensa should not apply for uh, a mining lease in Moli National Park? What is of significance is what does the, hold on, let me answer your question. What does the authorities make of that application? If the authorities consider the application or grant the application, then we can be up in arms, then we can be worried, then we can be scandalized. In this particular case, when this high street company made the application, the application was rejected ab initio at the point of lodging the application at the Minerals Commission. And therefore, the application did not even find its way to my desk, who is the minister who has a final, or, 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 uh, uh, final authority, authority to grant or disallow an application of that nature. And so when the matter broke out, when, I, when my attention was drawn to it, I had to contact the CEO of the Minerals Commission. Now, what is this report I'm receiving that mining is taking place in Kakum National Park? And his response was that, Minister, you, you are not aware of this particular situation because this application was rejected from the very get-go, ab initio. And yet you have headlines, Kakum National Park under threat, Kakum National Park being mined, Kakum National Park uh, being attacked by a mining company. When the application that is supposed to be the subject matter of this so-called scandal was rejected at the very moment of it being lodged or at the moment of the application being put before the Minerals Commission. And, and, and we are not... Um, so, so what would be the, the source of the concern? So, so the source of the concern here is this. Mm -hmm. We've seen what's happening in the Upper Prama Forest. That's a forest reserve in the Etiwa Forest. I have been in the Etiwa Forest for two days doing a documentary on how illegal mining is destroying the forest cover there. We approached certain companies who said they have been given mining licenses to mine in the Etiwa Forest. And there are other forest reserves. In fact, we got copies of 47 entry permits that have been given by the Forestry Commission for companies to get into 47 forest reserves across the country. To do so, to, to do prospecting. So if you see this consistent disregard for the preservation of forest reserve, then the company would then have the confidence to even want to put an application to, to, to get a license to mine in the Kakum National Park. That's what I'm saying, that if there's been a consistent, committed, sincere decision to ensure the preservation of forest reserve, a company would not even think of even putting in an application, even if there is gold in the first Z or in the national park. That's where my concern is. So first of all, uh, I cannot, with the greatest of respect, and in all humility and modesty, um, um, uh, you know, gauge companies' confidence or otherwise. What is of um, consequence to me, as the minister responsible for uh, lands and natural resources, is that what is made of that application? The high street application to, for a mining lease in Kakum National Park was rejected. And for me, that is highly commendable. The Minerals Commission did such a good job in rejecting the application from the very get-go and not even allowing the application to progress to the level of the minister for the minister to make a determination of that application. And that should be seen as a commitment by the government to preserve our forest reserves, Kakum National Park inclusive. So that is point number one. Point number two. In 2021, I issued a directive for all prospecting to cease in forest reserves. So they cannot be prospecting in a forest reserve. So as we hold speak, on, Dan, there's no prospecting hold, hold going on in any forest hold reserve. Hold on, hold on. I'm saying that in 2021, I issued a ministerial directive that all forests, all prospecting in forest reserves are at law. Mm -hmm. So you cannot have a situation of prospecting in a forest reserve. So if anybody were to claim to be prospecting in a forest reserve, the person will be engaged in illegal mining or illegal activity. So the suggestion that there are so many people, so many companies prospecting in so many forest reserves cannot be correct. If anybody, uh, if, it, if anybody um, purports to be prospecting in a forest reserve, that action is an illegality and has to be dealt with. And if that was, be brought, if that was brought to my attention, that obviously will be dealt with. So the question of prospecting in forest reserve had been conclusively dealt with as far back as 2021. The reasons why 
we, we, we put a stop on prospecting in forestry. It's obvious to you and I, and it's mm -hmm. obvious to everybody, that in the past, people came for prospecting licenses, which had a lower standard of environmental protocols, and ended up using the prospecting licenses to mine. And when you confronted them, they said they have a license, but yet it was a prospecting license. So we banned prospecting in forest reserves. Thirdly, the 47, uh, so-called 47 forest entry permits, I'll be happy to see them. So we'll, I'll be happy we'll, we'll to make see, them available. I'll be happy to see this, this so-called 47 forest entry permits for mining. Because it will be, uh, I'll find it completely strange to have 47 forest entry permits for mining in forest reserves. Because first of all, as I indicated to you, small-scale mining is not permitted in forest reserves. Small scale mining is not permitted in forest reserves. So if you have any uh, uh, mining in forest reserves, it must be a large scale mining. And it must be with a forest entry permit, environmental uh, EPA permit. Uh, it must have the strictest of environmental protocols. I want to just conclude by saying that, look, this is a difficult fight, and I, 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 I have no um, illusions about that. Uh, I, we always knew that we we're going to run into a lot of challenges. We knew it was going to be a long fight. We knew it was going to be complicated. But the mm -hmm. determination to get on with the fight has never been challenged, in, have never been lost on us in any form or shape. And indeed and in fact, I believe that we are making some progress. And the measures we put in place, if we keep at it and we are steadfast for a, a, a certain period of time, we will see much the, the, more. This directive that you gave for the uh, entry permits to cease in Forest Reserve from, in 2021, did it take retrospective effect because, the, because of the intention of, of the... Absolutely. It took it retrospective. Took retrospective effect. It took okay. retrospective effect. It was a complete ban on prospecting in Forest Reserve. So if you had a prospecting license before that directive was given, you were not allowed into a Forest Reserve. And as a matter of fact, we do not grant prospecting licenses for Forest Reserve to date. We don't. So you can say to the cameras that there is no prospecting going on in forest reserves. I don't, I don't have to say anything. To, I don't have to say anything to the cameras. The facts I'm giving you. Uh -huh. This is the truth. The truth of the matter is that if there is any prospecting happening in a forest reserve, it's an illegality because we ban prospecting. The only prospecting license which has been granted for the mining of bauxite, not gold, is rock shore in the Tiwa Forest uh, in the Hini. Uh, not to, uh, in the, in the Hini, uh, but that may not even be a forest reserve, so it doesn't even come up. But the prospecting which has been granted for prospecting to take place in respect of bauxite resources is what was granted for rock shore under the uh, integrated aluminium framework. But the fact remains, and that is a fact, it's as far back as 2021. I'm surprised you are not aware of that. Oh, that I, well, I, you, I, you are I, not. I am. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm asking specific so, questions about what exactly is the, the impact of this? Because you are saying that there is no prospecting going on. So I just wanted you to be on record that it is indeed the case that if we get any news that there is prospecting going on in any forest reserve, it is illegal and it's not coming from you. It and you cannot, are not supporting it in any no, way. No, 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 for Moshe, it cannot come from me. We gave that directive for good measure. And, and these are not some populist, um, if you want, um, high-standing uh, policy measures. These are measures which are necessary. If we ever got to a point where we're satisfied as a country and as a government that we could allow prospecting in forest reserves, we'll take that decision. But as it is today, as it is today, and as it was as far back as 2021, and as I, I and the ministry came to that conclusion or that judgment, the issuance of prospecting licenses in forest reserves had become a major bane for the protection and preservation of the forest reserves of our country. And we took that decision, and I made that announcement public, mm. and we stuck to that up to date, that we are not permitting prospecting in forest reserves. No, or any form of mining. Forest reserves should be preserved. Or any form of... Or any form of mining. Forest reserves should be preserved, off limit to any mining activity. Forest reserves should be preserved, but large scale mining is permitted in forest reserves, as it is for Newmont. So I can tell you that mining cannot take place in forest reserves, or mining is not taking place in forest reserves, because Newmont is mining in a forest reserve today. Except that mining in a forest reserve comes with a much more stringent environmental protocol. So let, if we want to ban mining in forest reserves, we have to come back to this house and amend the law. It's not my law, it's not my decision. The law allows mining in a forest, except that it must be large scale mining, not small scale except that the environmental regime is much more stringent 
except that you must have an EPA permit which should monitor your activities closely, except that you must have a much more um, robust reclamation and revegetation regime so that whatever mining that takes place, you then have to reclaim the land, you have to revegetate the land, and so on and so forth. So these are the measures. Now, uh, is it the LI2462, even though it is not your ministry's law, because you indicated that it is the Environment Science Technology Ministry that brought it to power for it to be approved. Concerns about it. Does, does that impact on your ministry's resolve to preserve forest reserves? Because that's the CSO's concern that this, in essence, is threatening your fight. On top of my head, I, I don't have, um, I, I don't have, I, I want to express a definite view on this ally. But I'm not particularly concerned because the substantive legislation and substantive laws relating to mining will not permit the inference you are drawing from this ally, which is that the ally permits mining in forest reserves indiscriminately. It cannot. To grant a lease and grant a forest entry permit and grant an EPA permit for mining to take place in the forest reserves is largely regulated by Act 703 and the enabling laws of the Forestry Commission and the EPA. Now, and how, how do you measure progress in this fight against illegal mining? Because you've been consistently saying that you've made some progress. Also admitting that there's quite a lot of challenges and, and also others that you have to deal with. So what are the parameters that you use in measuring the progress in this fight against illegal mining? Well, multiple reports from the Inspectorate Division of the Minerals Commission, that's very useful, mm -hmm. very, very important. Reports from the security agencies, Operation Halt, and the reports they bring to my decks. Uh, reports from a lot of sources, civil society organization, media people like you, and so on and so forth. Failed inspection, and so on and so forth. Of course, I hear people talk about the color of the river bodies of our country. That is a legitimate point to make. But the truth also is that the scientists have told us, you must have to indicated to us that even if, even if you had to stop all forms of mining or any other activities on the river bodies of our country, you will need a considerable period of time for the river body to organically, organically restore its color and restore its integrity. Mm. And, 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 and we saw that after 2017, 2018, when there was, there was the ban, we saw it. The water bodies became cleaner. At least we saw a number of them. You also went to some of them, fetched some of the water, showed that, that it was clean. So it can be done, and it is possible. Is it it has been done. It's been done, as I said to you. It's been done. A lot of measures have been put in place, and we are pursuing the measures. The president put his presidency on the line right from the beginning of his presidency. Mm -hmm. That if he fails, in fact, this commitment to fight illegal mining. Over the period, you say some successes have been chalked, and there is a lot more that has to be done. Some say the president has failed, and even this commitment to put his presidency on the line is one that he only made as a statement and not any form of commitment, other than that he should have resigned by now. What's your take on that? <laughs> well, first of all, I, I don't know your interpretation of the president putting his presidency on the line, but um, most respectfully, what that simply meant, or what that can, what it can only mean, is that he was prepared, for want of a better expression, if you allow me to use this expression, he was prepared to damn the consequences and proceed with the fight. And, and as a matter of fact, this was a time when the president was being threatened by electorates in mining constituencies, that if he did not stop the measures he was pursuing, he was going to, they were going to vote against him and his party. And he said, I'm going to put my presidency on the line. I'm going to put my presidency on the line means that, come what may, I'm going to move forward with the measures I'm pursuing because they are in the interest of our country. Was he really committed to this? He was absolutely committed to that. He paid for it in the elections of 2020. He lost in almost all the mining communities in our country. Was that why oh, you relaxed the measures well, no, but, that led to the influence of Which of the measures have been relaxed? I, name one. Illegal mining. After name, the name ban, one measure. after name. the ban, mm -hmm. the, we've seen an increase in illegal miners. And you talked about mm -hmm. it as well. After the ban, at least, 
there should be measures in place to sustain the gains that were made. Yeah, but, but there are the, the gains have retrogressed over the period. There are, there, there are measures in place, and those measures are being pursued and being pursued vigorously. First of all, let me clarify the misconception that about the president putting his presidency on the line. Putting his presidency on the line is, means he's going to grit his teeth. He's going to stiffen his spine and move through with his measures, regardless of the consequences it will have on his presidency. Even if he was to lose his presidency in the ensuing elections or in the, in the upcoming, in the upcoming election, the elections which was to come up, which was the 2020 elections, and he paid for it. He lost almost all the mining constituencies in our country, with the exception of, I think, with the exception of Etakwa in Suem, mm -hmm. where he won marginally. He lost all the mining constituencies of our country. So the president meant it when he said he was putting his presidency on the line, and he still means it. And ever since, he has continued through the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources to pursue the measures which will help us come to grips with the issue of illegal mining activities in our country. Almost all the measures are still being pursued. The soldiers are out there. I get lambasted every day that people's excavators are being bent. And as I said to you, a week ago, there was a clash between forest guards and illegal, um, illegal mining operators in a particular forest reserve. So by no stretch, no, uh, under any stretch of imagination, the measures, the, the measures which are being pursued have not been relaxed. On the contrary, the measures have been enhanced. We are increasing our measures, we are increasing the enforcement mechanism, we are increasing the reformative uh, arrangements we have, and we are pursuing all the measures which are required to get us to come to grips with the issue of illegal mining activities in our country. And so the president has been very reliable, has been very credible, and has stuck to all the measures he's put in place to deal with illegal mining activities. There's no question about that. You haven't relaxed it because you need, you need money to finance your campaign. From where? From, money from where? From, from, from these Ill illegal small-scale miners. Well, to, fi to finance this campaign, MPP's campaign? They finance, at least, there's been reports by the CDD that some of these illegal miners finance the campaigns of political parties in this country. Really? I'm unaware of that. And how does that work? The illegal miners will do what? Will contribute to the campaign's uh, accounts or com com uh, contribute to their uh, fundraising measures or, or how? How does that work? Then they give you money. And then you, even the members of parliament, because this is not a national fight. It's supposed to be led, at least, decentralize the process, is it not? But then you see a, a very lax approach by some persons who are at the various levels of accountability because of the benefits they are getting from this legal manager. You don't know about it? Well, I'm not, I'm not, um, I, I wouldn't um, pretend to be naive or ignorant of the tendency for criminal cartels and criminal operatives in any form or shape, whether in the drug industry, in the uh, cocoa industry, or in the mining industry, or what have you, to corrupt officials and, 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 and corrupt authorities. I, 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 I will never, uh, pretend that that is not possible. That is possible. But when that happens, that is illegal, that is unlawful, that is wrong, and that has to be dealt with. And any government or any official worth the salt should never lower himself or herself so as to allow an illegal mining operator to corrupt the person. And so we keep an eye on all of those things. And, and if you say that uh, illegal mining operators will contribute to the campaign of political parties. I understood it to mean that they will contribute officially to the centralized fundraising uh, portfolio of various political parties. If it is about corrupting individual officials, corrupting a minister, corrupting a deputy minister, or corrupting a security officer, that is possible. But that should not be countenance. That should not be countenance in any form or shape. I would want to thank you very much for, <laughs> for, for coming. And, uh, and, and I know you would have to get in there unless yes. you have some. You, you, you got a, a budget interview now for illegal mining. Oh, well and good. <laughs> but I've, I've, I've enjoyed I've, it thoroughly. Indeed. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Indeed. We should find time and, and talk a lot more about these things. Indeed. OK? Indeed. All right, my friends. Thank you. Thank, thank you, very, you much. very much. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. He's the uh, member of parliament for the Damongo constituency. He is a minister for lands and natural resources and then also a number of committees in parliament. Samuel Abujinapo there. Are you still live here on the live coverage of the 2024 budget? <laughs> on the budget presentation of the finance minister 
and 2024 fiscal document. You're, 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 still, you're still live here on 3FM 92.7, also on TV3 Ghana on Facebook and uh, DSTV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. And uh, uh, join us, join us and let's have a conversation. Shortly, the finance minister will be uh, presenting this budget before the House. The businesses of the House have started already. And uh, we, we were getting to all the issues and the concerns are happening. It's live here on TV3. And Dr. Stephen Amua is the Member of Parliament for the Insurance Constituency, is a Deputy Trade and Industry Minister. Dr. Stephen Amua, thank you very much. It's a for pleasure. Coming. Now, uh, I, I start off with, with this uh, the 1D1F. Come again. The 1D1F. You know, there's been a number of concerns raised about how many of these factories are actually up and running ah. and operational. But how can you ask how many, me this? How many? How many? After we are doing budget. You, yes, it's part of the budget ah. conversation. Yes. Ah. It's, it's not just, going to be captured in the budget. And right now, in fact, it's ongoing. Okay. So right now, if I give you a figure, it may not represent. With, with the others. Yes. So unless I call the ministry now to know by what, last what? week, by today, by yesterday, how many <laughs> of them? There are the, 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 the business community has raised specific concerns about how increasing taxes is impacting on the cost of doing business, especially. And then one of the major expectations that they have, which I'm sure they have come to you on, I mean, the likes of the Ghana Union you know, of Traders Association, which I know you specifically have been engaging a lot. Now about the impact of, of the taxes on their business. <laughs> Government's objective is to increase tax to GDP from 13 to 18 percent. Now, do you consider these concerns by the, the business community as credible, really? That has to be addressed by this budget. Uh, thank you very much for your important question. Um, honestly speaking, their concerns are very credible, very, very tangible. However, we have to understand one fact, and the fact is taxation or tax policies, eh, tax policy management is calibrated in nature. When we say a policy is calibrated in nature, you can't just wake up and say that you are increasing taxes or reducing taxes, no. It depends on how your fiscal space is performing. You know fiscal space. The key variables are government projects and programs, government social contract with the people, against the financing options and availability of funds of the government. If you have borrowed such like that your debt to GDP is getting alarming, such as we've done, as a result of the fact that we had to go through impaired productivity for months. We had to lose over 12 billion taxes that we were supposed to collect that we could not. And private sector had to sack about 40,000 people and we're staying home not working, impairing GDP growth at that time. And because tax collection had become a problem because we were not going to the market and there were no economic activities, Government also still had obligations, so government had to use that financing. So we borrowed, and our GDP was not growing. So our debt to GDP became so high, and then we've been lost to our investors, the market confidence we need as a country. That even forced us into going to I, uh, IMF. Now, the economic management is like your health. If you go and see a doctor today, and the doctor does diagnosis. It is the doctor that will prescribe medicines or advice to you. People should allow those who understand the economic management, financial economic management, to really prescribe the needed advice and policies. I beg them. What is happening in our country today is that if NDC had been in power, MPP would have behaved the way they are behaving. Mm. This cycle, we should help us to stop, especially great 
a media platform like TV3. You are a very uh, experienced uh, media guy. Just realize that anytime NDC are in government, all the things they want to do, MPP will rise against, and vice versa. Is it right? Now that your debt in GDP is high, you can't borrow alarmingly again. You are forced not to take taxes, the, 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 uh, the, the, the neither taxes. How are we going to finance our projects, our programs, our social contract, uh, contracts? How are we going to finance them? Then our brothers from the opposite are saying, that, oh, we should reduce government sizes. We should do that. In, I mean, the quantification of that. One of the weaknesses in our country today that I've seen with the NDC and PP and the other stakeholders, they always make qualitative statements. You cannot manage a country's economy with qualitative statements. They should come clear that, oh, okay, if you cut down the size of the government by this, you can save this amount. We need X amount to perform our social, financial, project, program obligations as a government. If you cut this, you can make room for it. Then you are making proper and very effective input. But you can't just speak just like that, literally like that. So we need taxes today as a better pay if your child is not well, my well, brother. Yeah, but, but I just want to find out. We've been swallowing this bitter pill for a while now. And that has always been the refrain from the finance minister, and which you are now also uh, singing the same tune, that we should bear in share and then swallow the bitter pill. For how long would you expect the people to swallow this bitter pill and not die, or to continue to bear in share and not collapse as a result of carrying the bigger part of the bedding. If we don't swallow the better pill, if we don't, we will die. If we swallow, we will suffer sometimes. The so, same government, 2017, what happened? We, the tax items we either introduce or reduce amounted to about 17. You remember uh, conduct All of tax. them you described as nuisance taxes. You took them off. Whichever way. But the point is, we reduce some of them. You remember condom taxes, uh, real estate taxes, mm -hmm. um, financial service taxes, all those. You remember Kayo taxes. Then after that, the GM government introduced a number of taxes mm -hmm. and even got to E levy. Indeed. So tax policies, it's not as and when you feel. It is like disease. If you look at the condition of your economy, then you decide to increase taxes or reduce them. In any case, we are restoring, we are improving. Now, inflation and other things are gradually coming up, but we are not there yet. Once we get to where we think we have done enough restoration and consolidation, we will adjust the taxes down. But you know that um, because you and I are economists and you are a pure finance person, I mean, tax multiplier effect on, on GDP is, is, is negative. I mean, this is economics 101. The tax collections, the tax multiplier GDP effect, is, not no. collection, the tax multiplier effect uh -huh. on the GDP. Uh -huh. So why does No, it depends the, on how you use it. Okay, no. well, it, it's it, depends not all time. On, it depends on the, it's the, not the, all the, the, the parameters you are looking at if you, as well. No, no, but, 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 let, me, but, let me explain but, something here to you. But, but me, then okay, again, finish, why does government always have this part of thinking that you can tax your way out of this I crisis? can't hear you. You can tax your way out of this crisis. I can't hear you. Why have you taken this approach that you, you, can, we, you can tax your way out of this crisis that we find ourselves in? <laughs> I'm surprised with all the explanation I'm giving to you. In any case, I want to speak to your earlier statement. Tax policies and collections do not necessarily impact GDP negatively. That is not true. It depends on how you use the revenue you generate domestically. And that is why I've been advising my government and other expenditures. Vice President. I have been saying that it is time we do regressional analysis of about 30, 40 year expenditures that we've made and the items and know which of the items have strong impact or correlation with or to GDP. Good. And those that do not, so that we take them out. Great. So it depends on what you spend your money on. It depends on the tax you collect against even other expenditure and then GDP enhancing factors. So it if you take the taxes and you don't use them well, 
Good. If you take the taxes and they don't go into areas that will rather enhance GDP growth, then of course what you are saying, I agree with you. Fantastic. That's. It. I'm speaking in the Ghanaian situation. Would you say that based on this statement of my analysis with tax multiply effect on GDP, the taxes we have collected have been used in productive areas, as you have suggested? I, I can say yes or no. Yes, because um, let's all be very honest. When you talk, they say, you always say COVID. We are not saying everything is about COVID. Okay. If you have impaired productivity, if you have um, a tax rundown of about 12 billion, definitely you have issues. But where I agree with you is the tax critical activity path. Mm -hmm. Some of the taxes that we collect, there are leakages. Ghana is one of the countries that corruption, in a way, over the years, is becoming a cultural vice, not virtue. It's becoming something that not only even politicians, is it the media, is it MPP, is it NDC, is it the police, is it the judge, is it the chief? So, so far as corruption lives among us, some of the taxes we collect might not go into productive areas that will rather enhance GDP growth or stability. However, some of the monies are used. You come to my constituency, for instance. There are so many road networks that we are working on in my constituency. School children are getting tables and chairs, at least under me, 2,200 school children out of my common fund. Go and check. That's the MP's common fund. Yes. Okay. Now they have ambulance there, they have street lights, but they are not enough. Mm -hmm. We have bought computers for all the schools in my constituency, SHS. You can go and check. We've done water, portable water for them. At least we are almost done with Kejase, Adi Ababa, we finished with Patasi School, they are all there. Now Kumasi to Accra, look at Insangom to Apija, it's done. Now they are trying to do the dual carriage that Kofu did in Insangom and in Koko, one at Konongo, one at Enginem, go and check. So some of the monies do not go into productive areas, which I agree with you, 100%. Some also go. But we need to take steps to correct these antisocial behaviors, mm -hmm. especially corruption and mismanagement, not only under one regime. And it's not only politicians, even the public sector, because they are on the value chain, the entire value chain of our economic development. For instance, if I want to fight corruption, yeah. I am arrested. I am a suspect or I've been charged. The prosecutor that will handle my documents and take me to court is the police. It is a judge that will pronounce whatever it is. See, I've, I've been over 50 years. Mm. I used to board my father's car, I'd like be on the same car with okay. my father. I used to see policemen standing by the roadside, glaringly, publicly taking bribe. Today, they do. So if you don't get policeman who is good, and he takes money and mismanage your prosecution document, how are you going to fair, get fair justice to fight corruption? Can Nanado or Mahama force policeman to do the right thing in a democratic dispensation? If the judge, if I'm able to see the judge over the weekend, and the judge takes money from me, and I start adjoining the cases, so everything you're saying today is true. But now my new advocacy trend is that let us begin to appreciate the fundamentals that are being inimical of dysfunctional to the performance of our economy and for that matter affecting lives and, and champion a new course. I don't know if you understand what indeed, I'm saying. Indeed, indeed. Me, I'm not praying NDC should come. But if NDC comes eh, and they introduce new taxes or increase taxes, I would rather analyze the fiscal space and see, oh, are they supposed to increase or not? Then I will champion my argument. Indeed. So I won't go the issue way of once it's NDC, I have to fight. So there should be a well, stop point. I, I think that everybody acknowledges the importance of taxes in a country's development. And as you have underscored quite clearly, it is what the tax revenue is used for. The evidence of it also encourages compliance in another form. But in our case, the concern is not about the 
introduction of new taxes. Businesses don't want that. What they want is efficiency in the tax collection system, which I'm sure, based on your own analysis, you would have also <laughs> your, your concerns about, that our processes in the tax collection is not efficient. And that's why we have so many holes in the tax collection process. And, and people tend to also evade taxes as well. So how can that be improved instead of increasing taxes or adding new ones? Um, boss, you see, the point you've raised, it is extremely relevant or important. And this same point has been raised over the years. Far before even, I'm sure, Kofor came. Far before former President Mahama came. Mm -hmm. Far before even Anadu came. Yes. So we all understand. Although it's not the only problem we have, mm -hmm. but it's one of the relevant issues we need to look at, important issues. The same businessmen, the same traders that are raising the issues, they make under declaration of what they bring into this country. They, you know, a trader, importer, could boldly tell me that, honorable, taxes in India, in key, you to mean to your entry, no correct. Mm. Now, they are higher and say, may kick I beg, forgive yes. me. Oh, no, no, no. They are higher and say, I'm quoting her. You find you have a fear of flower, Nigeria, near the bar. You are in craft, you are in a bright. You are drunk, a cra, no one with your more tom with you. If you are a crab, Masseno, Nigeria, and Suntian, your boca. This is what the woman told me. You remember that import taxes, import taxes. Were reduced by 50% when Anadu came first. And importation of cars, 30%. These importers were still under declaring their goods. So, as much as I agree with you that the key stakeholders must look at this area so that we don't put all the, you know, that direct tax is only 2 million out of 30 million people. 32 million people pay tax. You and I, just direct tax. And the indirect tax, there are so many leakages. Right from, I would say, politicians, public servants, GRA, SEPs, immigration. Look, let me tell you this story. Cable, cables, cables. We have three major companies, leading companies. We have Nexus, we have Tropical, and one of them. Now one has totally collapsed. The others are operating at half capacity. Do you know why? The same item they produce in Ghana, and somebody imports. Those who import their retail price, retail, is less than direct cost of production. Why? Wow. Because they don't pay taxes. Mm. Which you have to blame government, including GRA and all those, and also blame those who bring the goods. You can't eat your cake and have. What do you say? So we are advising us which 100%. Let us also advise importers for them to know the importance of what they are doing, the effect on us as a country in the long term. Indeed, indeed. You see, and then also the other bit about, which is, is a very important point that you made as well, um, and I'm looking at this whole path of expanding the tax net. Since I was in the kindergarten, and I'm sure you've, you've, this is a song we've been singing since, expanding the tax net, expanding the tax net. So what exactly is the challenge in not being able to effectively expand the tax net to capture the taxable population. The finance minister himself has said in time past that so many lawyers are not paying taxes, many other professionals and so on. But yet again, as you indicated, just a few of us within that formal tax bracket are paying taxes. So where, where is the challenge in not being able to do that efficiently? Um, first, I'll list the challenges. First is the corruption issue, leakage. Right. Because of that, classification of those who pay taxes are challenged. That's one. Two, database. Any country that you address system, your database, in terms of integrity and correctness, are questionable. Some of these things can happen. So that's why I'm very happy about the digitization, NIA, and what we are doing. Mm -hmm. So we need to expedite actions on them quickly and deal with them. We should have finished by now. The next thing is, you need the artisans. If I were having the opportunity to widen the tax net, do you know one areas we are failing as a country? The artisans. Mm. Now, carpenters. 
They take 150 Ghana cities a day in Kumase. I'm sure a crowd will go higher. 150 a day. They take small portion. They charge 40,000. They don't pay taxes because we don't have database on them or of them. So one area, if I were with the finance ministry, I would tackle quickly is to get the database of all artisans in Ghana. That one, it will help them as, as professionals to even get jobs. You go online, you can have access to them. It will be difficult for them to steal because we have captured their bio data, everything. Then we can introduce artisanship tax. You understand what I'm saying? Artisanship tax. So that if a carpenter is coming to do my work and it's one CD, it can be one CD, 50 pesos. Right. So that the 50 pesos will go to the government. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things we are not doing in Ghana. Because our market is the defensive type. When I say a market is defensive type, boss, it means that most of our market structures are the SMEs. They form about 90 percent. And because they always appear informal, we don't have proper data on them. We have not designed proper economic framework that contains them for us to have the right information. Taxes are not being paid. So it's one area government should look at. But these things, you need a financial economist that understands these models, how to develop them. That's where you come and in. That, oh, me, yeah, let me stay in my corner small. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? And that is one thing that we have failed to do because the small businesses are not being taxed. And that is why there is so much tax increment on a few that do importation and they are suffering. Mm -hmm. So we are getting small amount and already we are running negative effective tax rate system. A negative Ghana, effective, effective tax, tax rate, rate system. system. What it means is that the amount of money governments out to lay every year, it doesn't matter who is government. If you divide that amount among all the households in Ghana and your house get 10 cities, mm -hmm. the amount government generate that year, excluding loans, if you divide that amount among the houses, your house will get far less than 10 cities. Mm. And that is why we always run what I call ritual deficit. We, uh, we are always having deficit. Okay. So when there's a global crisis or turbulence, then it worsens. So we have a lot of weak fundamentals. A lot of, a country that government borrows on our domestic market at a higher rate than, I mean, than the private sector, which means risk, risk free assets, give returns more than risky assets. There's no properly established economic framework that treasury bills in the country will offer returns higher than the banking sector. It's not done. But fact, it is happening. Yeah, for about 30 years. So all the models and formulas we use in the world, from 1965 by Sharp, in the 70s by Ross, in the 90s by two people, uh, Hanan and Lian, and then in the 20s by Deming, and then 2021 by me, marked by Canadian and Pakistani professors in uh, Ghana. All the formulas, those first traditional three, they don't work in Ghana. Because there are so many fundamental errors that some of our budget framework should be redeveloped and reviewed. There will be new introduction in terms of fundamental models and put the economy, and that is why small things, it's like things are being run qualitatively right. and on an ad hoc basis. Because there are so many wrong models and wrong policies. Without that, it will be difficult. Be difficult. Our concentration Indeed. should be on the defensive sector, SMEs, get the right data, get the right money, put proper system in place to check leakages, then we are good to go. I thank you for coming. It's a pleasure. It. It's a pleasure. Thank, thank, you. thank you for having me. Dr. Stephen Amwa is Member of Parliament for the Insurance Constituency. He's uh, a Deputy Trade and Industry Minister. He's a financial economist uh, as well. Uh, and, and getting into a number of the issues. In fact, there is that clear admission of the, the fundamentals that we are faced with as a country. And how that impacts on the